How is it that a person can transform from being a ordinary school teacher into becoming the Chinese younger brother of Jesus and the leader of a rebellion that would end up costing the lives of millions of people? Like most things that involve change and transformation, it happens slowly, and it's difficult to pinpoint the exact moment where one thing becomes another. Of course, we're talking about Hong Shu Chuan here, the eventual leader of the Taiping movement that would result in the Taiping Rebellion or the Taiping Civil War. And when the traditional story is told, it often begins with the famously bizarre fever dreams that Hong has around 1837. Luckily for us in the modern day, Hong wrote down a lot of the content of these fever dreams and he turned them into poems of some sort. And I'll read you a couple of lines from Hong here. He says, quote, My hand grasps the killing power in heaven and earth to behead the evil ones, spare the just, and ease the people's sorrow. My eyes roam north and west, beyond the rivers and mountains. My voice booms east and south to the edge of the sun and the moon. With the three-foot blade in my hand, I bring peace to the mountains and rivers, all peoples living as one, united in kindness. Seizing the evil demons, I send them back to earth and scoop up the last of the evildoers in a heavenly net. End quote. Now, these fever dreams from Hong are important, and they're often told in this story of the Taiping Rebellion because, as you can hear from those quotes, it's very easy to draw a line from the apocalyptic and somewhat violent tone of those poems to the apocalyptic and incredibly violent nature of the Taiping Civil War. So this fever dream origin story of the Taiping Rebellion is often talked about, but I do think, as we've been doing with this whole series, it's important to put these fever dreams and Hong in general in a context that fits with the time period in order to better understand it. Historian Stephen Platt, in his book Autumn in the Heavenly Kingdom, gives a bit of a summary of Hong's early life, talking about Hong's early life, his community where he came from, and his beginnings as a school teacher, saying, quote, The villagers were mostly relatives from their clan, which had once been a grand one. Back in the days of the Song Dynasty, many of them had served as high officials and imperial advisors. But that was a very long time ago, and now they were poor farmers. They did, however, have a small schoolhouse where Hong Shu Chuan began studying the Confucian classics at the age of seven. He distinguished himself immediately, and in a few years had memorized the four books, the five classics, and the other texts required for the civil service examinations. By his early teens, he had also read widely in Chinese history and literature, and was so bright, his family believed that he could understand the ancient texts at first reading without assistance. They dreamed that he would restore their long-lost family glory, and several of his teachers worked without pay in hopes that their reward would come when he passed the exams and became an official. As his need for more specialized training took him farther from the village, his family pooled their resources to support him, though by age 16 he was already supporting himself as a school teacher with a small salary paid primarily in rice, lard, salt, and lamp oil. End quote. I think that quote, in some ways, seems like a very basic summary of Hong's early life, but I like it because it sets the stage for a lot of the important things that are going to become part of this story. Interestingly, I think that Hong's early life and his early story highlights how much of the eventual appeal of the Taiping would come from people who 
believed that they used to be a little bit higher on the social ladder. Maybe during previous dynasties or previous eras, they had family members who did well on the civil service examinations, and as a result, they were important people in the government or the bureaucracy. But now, due to corruption or bad luck or maybe some fault of the ruling Manchu dynasty, they don't have that anymore, and now they're all just poor farmers. Eventually, Hong and the Taiping would appeal to the disenfranchised. And Hong, of course, knew how to sell this because he himself was from a disillusioned and disenfranchised type of family. At least that's the story that they told themselves. And you had many families, just like the family that Hong came from, who would put their hopes and dreams, in a sense, into a exam candidate like Hong. And of course, it would take years of study and lots of money to hire tutors and traveling expenses and competing against people from wealthier and more privileged families. And eventually, as was the case with Hong, disillusionment tends to set in. Hong failed the exams over and over again. And as he and others like him continue to fail and set themselves up for failure in life as a result, you get a questioning of Confucianism in general and really the whole civil service exam operation in general. Because if this is the correct philosophy of life or this is the rightful governing situation, then why are there so many failures in the world? Hong Shu Chuan begins to look at the civil service exam and his failures in that sense, and he begins to interpret those fever dreams that he had in the context of that. And he also is painting his fever dreams in the larger context of China, which includes these exam candidates who are mad at the bureaucracy. It includes most of the population who is somewhat upset with the British. The humiliations of the opium wars are ongoing as Hong is figuring all of this out. You have local militia and pirates and bandits all across China who are stirring up controversy. You have southern Chinese and northern ethnic Manchu upset and paranoid of each other. So for someone like Hong Xuchuan, who is disillusioned to begin with, he's also interpreting his life story in the larger context of the general dysfunction of China at the time period. Eventually, some of these culturally syncretized Christian religious texts work their way into the hands of Hong, and he starts interpreting his apocalyptic fever dreams through the context of this syncretized version of Christianity. For example, one of the pamphlets or essays that Hong gets his hands on as it's discussing the Christian Ten Commandments, one of those moral exhortations in this text is basically, thou shall not smoke opium. So you're seeing how the original religion is being a little bit twisted and warped by the missionaries who are trying to push this into China. And Hong starts taking that a step further, where he's now taking these already syncretized and mixed texts, and he's now writing his own, and he's now interpreting all of this Christianity into his own lens of Chinese mythology and history. And remember that Hong is working with translations and texts that are incomplete and originally translated in a way to help Chinese people understand some of the content has changed, some of the stories are altered to appeal more to certain parts of Chinese history, but Hong is citing these absolutely. 
of course, eventually Hong winds up in a place where he has his own version of Christianity with him as the younger brother of Jesus. He begins converting friends and close family members, and he begins preaching his new religion. Remember that he's still a school teacher at this time, and now instead of teaching the Confucian texts and the basic principles of maybe preparation for the civil service exam, Hong is now teaching his new religion at his school. I mean, imagine someone in the United States of America, maybe during the height of the Cold War, preaching the value of communism, tearing down American flags in class, this type of thing. Of course, Hong gets fired, parents are complaining, they're withdrawing their students, and Hong decides this isn't the way to do this. So he decides to go on a pilgrimage to educate the rest of China. He starts with mostly his family and the rural villages surrounding his hometown. As he gathers converts and trusted advisors, they start to create their own religious texts with their own commandments. They develop rituals and services. They travel all around different parts of China, spreading the messages, but also destroying Buddhist and Confucian temples and holy sites. The religion itself is a mix of Christianity, Chinese mythology, apocalyptic and good versus evil rhetoric, and increasingly over time it becomes more political. The evil demons become the Manchu rulers of China, and increasingly the Qing dynasty itself is becoming the enemy. It is worth asking, who is this message appealing to? As we said earlier, Hong has a large net of relatives and friends and community members. There's also a sort of ethnic group known as the Hakka people who share a connection with Hong and are increasingly on board with his mission and his overall goals. Just like the original Christian, Hong's message appeals very much to the rural and the poor. Historian Jonathan Spence says, quote, Among these earliest god worshippers are miners who work either in the silver loads that can still be found in Thistle Mountain or in the coal mines that dot the region. There are carpenters, blacksmiths, and rice flour grinders itinerant barbers and fortune tellers, sellers of medicines, salt, opium, or bean curd, boatmen, fuel gatherers, charcoal burners, herdsmen, peddlers, as well as those casual laborers who get by from day to day as best they can. End quote. Hong's message is appealing to the lowest members of society in China, as we said earlier, it's also appealing to the underworld and the anti-institution, anti-establishment types, bandits, smugglers, more middle and upper class people who are just disillusioned with the civil service system, or local elites who are outcasts or on the bad side of the Qing dynasty, people in the examination pool who continue to fail and don't see any upward mobility for themselves in society, wealthier elites not satisfied with the Qing, or perhaps they've been shunned because of their ethnic situation or their non-Manchu status. And as Hong keeps traveling and recruiting more and more people, especially people from a little bit of a wealthier type of situation, he and his movement are now getting greater access to wealth and resources. So as the general situation in China continues to devolve, pirates and smugglers are now moving inland as a result of increased British piracy control as a result of opium war treaties. People are now beginning to basically flee to these Taiping 
religious clans, and they're now looking to them for protection and security. Taiping numbers are now swelling with converts. Basically, armies are now forming, and the religion, the rules, the morality is continuing to evolve until it all reaches a boiling point where eventually the Qing army is going to have to go sniff around these areas and investigate what the heck is going on. You get some initial skirmishes that are inconclusive, but the Taiping numbers continue to grow. Historian Stephen Platt says, quote, Through 1851 and 1852, the Taiping army fought its way north, absorbing the poor and disenfranchised, the criminals, all those who feared or hated the reigning Qing dynasty authorities, all who would convert to their brand of Christianity and commit themselves to the destruction of Confucianism, and above all, the Manchu overlords. By the time they reached the Yangtze River cutting through central China in January 1853, there were half a million of them, and quote. Eventually, Hong Xuchuan decides that Nanjing is the destination for this army, and it's the destination for starting the earthly paradise of the Taiping Heavenly Kingdom. When the army reaches Nanjing, they are able to breach the walls, they slay almost 50,000 Manchus there, burning homes, raping and pillaging, destroying everything in their path, and after the initial period of looting and burning and executing, it's time to set up their society. Family units are established and in large part based on military hierarchy. Public treasuries that can dole out wealth to people in need are set up. A census and tax system is created. Taoist and Buddhist temples are burned and priests are executed. Interestingly, Catholics and Muslims are treated slightly better. One of the first things the Taiping do in Nanjing is take over the printing industry, and they start cranking out books of the Bible. Again, this is their syncretized version, which sometimes omits phrases and passages that don't jive with the Taiping political agenda. Famously, the Taiping separate the men and the women in their society, at least for a couple of years. And they begin consolidating the military and figuring out their larger goals for China. So earlier in the episode, we asked, how do transformations happen? And the answer was slowly and involving the context of a lot of different forces that are surrounding the person or the event. And that's certainly what happened here. Hong Xuchuan has his fever dreams, I believe, in 1837, but he then spends the better part of close to two decades interpreting those fever dreams, imbibing Christian religious texts, translating and creating and synthesizing all of these different cultural elements turning the ruling Qing dynasty into the evil demons that need to be slayed, and ultimately steering this Taiping civil war into fruition. So it takes a long time, and it's a gradual change, but it's also worth noting how strange and bizarre this must have looked to people at the time. When the Taiping take over Nanjing in 1853, all of a sudden you have a rebel movement with strength in enormous numbers in charge of most of southern China. You have the Qing dynasty controlling northern China. You have all the makings of a civil war that is going to be bloody and destructive and atrocities that are going to be traded from side to side. You have 
foreigners like the British, the French, the Americans in China, and they're observing this basically completely baffled. Christian missionaries are initially pleased with this development. It's long been a dream to turn China into a Christian stronghold. That initial contentment with the Taiping would eventually fade, as we're going to talk about. But at any rate, the stage for the Taiping Civil War with all of the different players and all of the surrounding context was now set, and the end result would be a civil war that lasted 11 more years and claimed the lives of millions of people leaving behind a legacy of desolation for those who survived it. 